This morning's reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. We are continuing in our series on the resurrection and just how it impacts us. And so we've been trying to focus on um, just the different times that Jesus appeared to people after the resurrection um, to encourage them in different ways. And each time so far, we've seen hopefully that he's, as he appears, it's always to push them in the direction of following him in different ways. The, the buzzwords that we're looking at today, the word discipleship, as it comes up in here, the word discipleship, the word evangelism comes up often in this passage. Those are two uh, buzzwords, words you hear a lot in the church community. And just like I was talking before, sometimes you hear those words, your eyes glaze over, or you don't even think about what the word means. But those words, the word discipleship and the word evangelism, uh, for those who know Christ should be very important to you. They should be integral to your faith. Uh, actually, what we're going to look at today is that the, the, the discipleship, disciple is basically the process of turning a, a godless person into someone who is more godly. It's people becoming more like Christ. Evangelism is about sharing your faith. And if you struggle with being identified with these things, evangelism and discipleship, uh, then this, the message today is for you. Uh, if you're someone who struggles with sharing your faith, thinking about sharing your faith, why would you share your faith, or even struggles about the idea of being a disciple, of seeing yourself as someone who, uh, who is godless and needing to become more like God, if any of those concepts are difficult for you, the message for you is for you today. This reminded me, uh, again, talking about words that kind of might confuse or just gloss over when you hear them. When I was a youth pastor uh, working at a, a large, very large church, I was asked to present on youth ministry uh, the status of the youth ministry to the, all the elders, the deacons, a huge group of uh, executives, basically, to present to them how the youth ministry was doing, how the, 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 youth, the ministry, all the stuff, the youth group, how they were doing. So I put together a 10-minute presentation. I wore my best shorts, um, and uh, I, I presented to them what was going on with the youth ministry. It was a very solid 10-minute presentation. At the time, I was 22. And the room was full of 50-plus-year-olds uh, right around that age. And I left thinking I nailed it. And the next day, I bumped into two of the guys who were at the meeting. And I said, how did I do? And they go, <laughs> and he goes well, uh, right when you left, one of the other gentlemen in the room looked at everyone in the room and said, I have no clue about any of the words that came out of his mouth. Um, and then the senior pastor said, that's OK. That's what we pay him for. Um, his job isn't to speak to us. His job is to speak to youth. Um, and so I guess I did okay. Uh, we're talking about evangelism and or discipleship. Um, again, what do those words mean to you? Do they confuse you? Do they just like water off of a duck's back where they don't even matter to you? Uh, today's message is for those to understand, for those to understand that, that we need these words in our faith. Or to put it differently, we're going to listen how power tools, families, and glue can transform you or even transform a church overnight. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time. Lord, we ask that you would send the Holy Spirit to work in all of our hearts. We especially pray for the children in our church. May they grow up knowing you as their Savior every moment. Lord, we pray for their families, um, for all those who work with kids. We pray for any adult children who have wandered away from faith, that the Holy Spirit would draw them back. We pray at this time now. Uh, that the, the power, the truth of the resurrection would reign in our hearts, that the Holy Spirit would make your word alive, and that we would die to sin. Father, we thank you. We ask all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So where we're at right now, where this passage I've already mentioned, Jesus appears mostly to encourage people in their faith, especially the disciples, and sometimes it's 
the 11 disciples, sometimes it's everyone who's a follower of Jesus. He's encouraging them to do something. Now that he's resurrected, he's encouraging them. So we're looking at these passages of the resurrection. And hopefully you're going to see that these are people who are trying to come to grips with what does it mean that Jesus is not dead and that he's alive. And so today's passage is rather famous. It has its nickname called the Great Commission. It's where Jesus is giving an idea of what he wants to do. But you'll see, hopefully, these last few weeks that Jesus is often doing this. So we start off with verses 16 to 17. And it says, now the 11 disciples, now this happens right after the disciples were told to go to Galilee. They were in a boat fishing. They couldn't catch anything. Jesus appears to them, tells them to do this amazing catch of fish. All this is still related to that event. And so now they were on the mountainside. And it says, 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to what Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And so this appearance is really to help those who are struggling, who are still doubting. And this word doubting here doesn't mean they were doubting the resurrection. It doesn't mean they were doubting faith. What it means is that they were doubting whether, what are they supposed to do? They were doubting. Remember, Jesus had just appeared to them uh, sometime before with this miraculous catch of fish. And he's reminding them from Mark 1.17, where he's telling them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So this is another continuing part of Jesus' conversation, reminding the disciples, the followers of Jesus, that he wants you to become a fisher of men as well. So some were doubting that part of the plan there. They, they see that he's resurrected. They understand that. They're worshiping, but they're still doubting this whole part of the plan. And I believe this appearance is really to help those who are doubting with that part. So again, so if you're doubting with your part in the plan of of sharing your faith or becoming or making disciples, this message is going to hit you square in the forehead today. No Bible thumping, but it's going to hit you right there. So Jesus' argument will be how to apply the resurrection to your understanding of your place in being a disciple, making disciples, and sharing your faith, that word evangelism. So let's look down to verse 26, 18. So we're going to get, th- I, I'm putting just, th- just three things Jesus says to uh, how his resurrection should influence that concept of, of making and being a disciple and sharing your faith. Again, integral parts to a Christian. So the first thing he says is verse 18. And Jesus came and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. So you have some doubting this plan of becoming fishers of men. And Jesus says, hey, I'm here, and I have all authority on heaven and on earth. Now, what is this arrangement? So this word authority, actually, the word means power. But it's the word power used in an authoritative sense, which is why authority is the right word here. But the word actually means power. He has all power in heaven and earth. And what is he doing with this power? He's giving us authority. He has the authority to do something. Now, I, I, as you know, I've, over the last few years, I've been slowly trying to move from, uh, gas power tools to electric power tools and battery power tools. Um, I, at one point I even brought a power tool up here, a a chainsaw. I'm not doing that today, but, uh, when we're talking about uh, what it means by power, uh, one time, a group of us were doing a whole bunch of yard work here, and uh, there was a big pile of leaves, and someone who was used to little uh, electric-powered air blowers, uh, leaf blowers, saw me come up with my brand new uh, leaf blower. Now, mine's like a rocket, but he's used to smaller ones, and he laughed and said, we aren't going to use this little leaf blower that you've brought. And I'm like, just turn it on. And it, he turned it on, and it was moving leaves at a massive capacity, and I have never felt better as a human. When he looked at me to acknowledge that I, he was wrong, and that this indeed was a real deal leaf blower. It had all the power to do the job. And so this word here is, a, is kind of a combination between power and authority, and the best way to conceptualize that is when the government has the absolute power and authority to make a law. And Jesus is basically saying that he is the law. He is the creator of it. He's been given all authority to do it. And what is he doing? What is the law stating here? By him saying, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, what he wants you to do is to understand that you have 
permission to become a disciple, and you have permission to make disciples, to share your faith. And this is important because a lot of us internally listen to other places, other authorities, to tell us whether or not we should be doing that. Uh, a great passage comes out of 1 Peter. It says this, Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Again, so all heavenly, all authorities, everything is under the authority of Jesus Christ. And where is he right now? Sitting at the right hand, the seat of power in the heavenlies. Everything is put under his control. And he is saying he's in charge and he is giving you permission to reorder your life to become a disciple. He is giving you permission to do this. He is giving you permission to make disciples and in so doing, sharing your faith. And this is profound because especially where we're living right now, other authorities, even maybe in your own heart, are telling you to not do that. You're going to have to decide who has the power, who is the author, who, is, who has the authority. And God is saying, I am giving you permission. I'm giving you permission to go against what you say, to go against what your culture says, and to make disciples. Now, many of you live in a world, this is D.C., many of you live in worlds that have lots of rules about what is appropriate and inappropriate conversation in your workplace. That does not excuse you. God has given you authority to find a way to make it work. There are a million ways to share your faith. There are many ways to create disciples. And God has given you the authority. He's given you permission to do that. It reminded me of uh, a time when I was living in London. And again, he's giving us permission to ha if you have to break tradition, if you have to break culture to do this, you do it. If you have to break your comfort zone, you do it. He's giving you permission to do it. In England, they're very private. The UK culture is very private, especially the English culture. We, we knew stories of people who would know people for a long time and wouldn't even know their name. In England, it's very inappropriate to ask someone what their job is. It's too personal. Now, imagine yourself being a pastor, trying to pastor and disciple someone, and they won't tell you their name, right? How are you doing? Oh, just, keep it, just keep it civil here, right? There's no way you can pastor. So I remember a time when I was preaching to a church, one of my first churches I was at when I was there, and I, I brought this up. And I said, you know, as a pastor, it is really hard for me to minister, to relate, to connect with any of you when you won't even tell me your names, right? I was given permission by the Lord Jesus to break their culture and tell them their job is to let me disciple them. And it was very funny, after the service was over, there was a long line of uh, men and women from England, even some Scotland, who were very sheepishly coming up to me after the service and saying, hi, my name is Bob. Hi, my name is John. <laughs> like they realized, and it took an American to say that, to snap them out of that. But for many of us, we are living in a culture that says we shouldn't. And Jesus says, I'm giving you permission. I have the authority and the power to do this. You need to do it. He's giving you permission to believe that it's important enough to become a disciple, to make disciples, and in so doing, again, sharing your faith. Let me get to the next verse, verse 19. It says, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And what is this talking about? Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. So the first one talking about, again, the authority Jesus has given here. The, the next part, I think, where the resurrection is making this real is this part about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'm less concerned about the making disciples. I'm more focusing for this passage on the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus is now elevating the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus is making them all equal. And he's saying, what I want you to do is to go baptize them in the name of these three things, these three persons the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Baptism uh, is a covenantal ceremony, right? Baptism is something we do out of uh, being a part of a community. That's what baptism is. 
Now, when we're talking about baptism in this context, what I want you to understand is that you're being baptized um, not into a relationship, but we're being baptized into is the relationship. It's the most important relationship that you'll ever be a part of. It's a family. Baptism is a covenantal ceremony we do within a family. So he's talking about this resurrection, the fact that he's alive. You're being baptized into something that's not dead, but alive. You're being baptized into the family. Something great. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. You probably can't pull it up just yet. Um, Let me open it up here. This is why I bring my Bible up here with me. Um, Galatians 3, 26 and 27 says, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you who are baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Again, what this verse is talking about is that you are going into something great. You're becoming a part of God's family. And so where am I going with this one? Again, the the first one is about authority. The second one is about family. How can this transform you? When I was doing premarital, I do premarital counseling a lot. And I was talking to, I was doing one set. And in premarital counseling, you want to make sure couples know all the pitfalls, all the dangers, all the obstacles, how hard it is to be married. And uh, someone mentioned during one of these sessions, she goes, you know, we're talking a lot about like the obstacles. Do we ever get to talk about the good part? And I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot to say marriage is great, <laughs> right? And so I realized that you've got to focus a lot. It's not just that it's hard, but there's, a lot, there's more great things than hard things in a marriage. There are hard things, but a marriage is great. And when I'm talking about this batch is that you're baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is talking about the community. You're going into the, the covenantal community. You're coming into the family. I want to talk a minute. When Jesus is talking about this, what he's saying is, do you believe when it comes to becoming a disciple, making disciples, sharing your faith, that a, an essential part of that needs to be your belief that it's better in the church than out of the church. You have to believe that. Not just give it lip service, but you have to believe that it's better in than it is out because you're being baptized into that. You're coming into a family. Here's just a couple of things. The greatest benefit of being in the family of God, again, is that through the death and resurrection of Christ, you have eternal life. That's the best. But here's a couple of interesting other things that come about by being united, being a faithful part of a church. Now, you've heard over the last decade or two, 40 million Americans have walked away from the church. 40 million less people go to church now than just a few decades ago. And a lot of people give different reasons for why they leave. But some very recent research has noticed some, some positive things for those who stay a faithful part of a church. So we're not talking about church once a month. We're talking about people where it is a joy and a desire to be in a church as often as you can. One thing they found is that for those who are faithfully part of a church regularly, I don't mean once a month, I'm talking very regularly, they live on average 10 to 15 years longer. Again, the greatest benefit is eternity with Jesus. But interesting fact, I would imagine the joy and hope that you have in Christ does do something. And the average person does tend to live longer. You've heard often that we've heard this, that that divorce rate is just as high for Christians as it is non-Christians. Well, that's actually, that was a very broad study. They researched that more and found that's not really true. For those who have an evangelical, again, a a, a discipleship-oriented faith in Jesus Christ, the divorce rate is is 50% lower, that the marriages last 50% longer. doesn't mean there are no divorces, but it does mean that for those where faith is more important than that, that being a part of the life of a church or is a joy and a part of it, their marriages tend to last longer. For those that are, again, a committed part of a church where the, the life of the church, being a part of this community, is an essential part of their faith. Their charitable giving to all causes, not just the church, but to all causes across America and abroad, are much higher across all economic spectrums, even the poorest. For those that are committed to a church, their giving is higher, their volunteering in organizations is higher. 
The adoption rate is higher amongst those in churches who are faithfully attending churches. It's even much higher that those who are faithfully part of a church, those who adopt children at greater need is even higher than that. People in churches adopt about two and a half times greater than the national average. There are many great, but again, there are many great benefits. The greatest is knowing Christ, but there is something that Christ is doing through the church. And I go back to this question when he's saying, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son, what is the church to you? One of the greatest lies, again, I was a youth pastor, is that what teenagers need is a big youth group. There's no statistical correlation between large, large youth group and teenagers holding under their faith. Where we do see correlation is teenagers who have been discipled, who are a part of a church and connected to community, tend to, no matter how far they may drift in a year or two, come back. It has nothing to do with the size of the church or the youth group. It has everything to do with that word discipleship, that becoming a disciple, making a disciple. So again, Jesus is the authority telling you, giving you permission to go and make disciples, to share your faith. I think Jesus is letting us know because of the resurrection, what we have through that, what we are baptized into, the covenantal community is the greatest community out there. But guys, you have to believe that. You have to believe that. That's an essential element in disciple-making. Now, this last part, verse 20. Oh, you're not going to have that. Verse 20 says this. Teaching them to observe all that I've came into you, and behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. I'm with you always to the end of the age. He's, because of the resurrection, he's, he can't be held back anymore. Death doesn't stop anymore. Death will never stop him. There's nothing that will prevent him, which means he's saying, I'm with you forever. Because of that, the resurrection is real. You can see him. He's saying, I need you to go. Become a disciple. Make disciples. Share your faith. I'm with you. And this I'm with you, I mean, let's go back to the people we're worried about. It's these, the people who are struggling with the doubt. What he's telling them is probably what they were doubting about. When he says, I'm with you always in the age, it's not saying, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to high five you in heaven. What it's saying is the process of becoming a disciple in your own life, the process of making disciples, the process of sharing your faith is probably going to include a lot of bumps and bruises. It's probably going to include a lot of fuzz. Uh, frustrating days about yourself, about others. It's not going to be an easy road to traverse, but he wants us to traverse it. He wants us to do it. There's a great passage in 2 Corinthians where Paul is talking about this. Paul's talking about what it means. The Apostle Paul is talking about what it's meant to him to be a disciple and how the resurrection has influenced the disciples to follow Jesus. And this is what they says here, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. Paul is saying the resurrection means, reminds us that Jesus is with us every step of the way. As difficult as that road is, it's becoming a disciple, making disciples, sharing your faith. He is with us every step of the way. When I was younger, and that, that term glue, uh, I, I, you know, permanent glue, uh, super glue, it's an interesting word, especially if you're younger. And I wanted to test the veracity of that. And so I remember putting super glue here and pushing my fingers together to see what would happen. And then freaking out when it happened exactly like it should have happened when my fingers were stuck together. You see, I'm fine now. But I remember doing that, testing that out. And what Jesus is saying is that that 
just like the properties of superglue keep it together forever. He's saying the, resurrect, the properties of the resurrection keep him with us for all time. And so he's saying these things to encourage you as this church, as people right here, you need to become a disciple. A godless person becoming godly. You need to be engaged in making disciples. And you need to be engaged in sharing your faith. How do we do this? Well, we go under the authority of Jesus Christ. We go in the name and under the work and under the power of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we go knowing that the eternal presence of Jesus is with us. I'll leave you with one last thought. Of those 40 million people have walked away, they estimate around 10% of that, four to five million, are people who have just, um, like I mentioned before, uh, it was right when the, the energy died, so you might have missed it. But for many people who have stopped going to church, um, we talked about church as a joy. Remember that part of the sermon? Uh, for many people, um, uh, just pulling back a little bit from being a part of a community um, enables them to pull back a little bit more. It enables them to pull back a little bit more to the point where they're no longer part of a community. It happens very easily. Even if you love being a part of a church, pulling back is easy to do, and pulling back more is, becomes even easier. Pulling back in is actually harder than pulling out. And what they found is that of that 40 million people walk away, there's roughly four to five million of them in America right now. There's over four million people in America right now who have a, their, their faith is completely there. Their belief system is all there. They've just fallen out of being part of a church community. Remember I talked about how can you transform yourself in a day? How can you transform a church in a day? There are literally millions of people in America right now who have just pulled back a little too far and it's snapped and they're just waiting to be pulled back in. Research has shown that there's roughly, again, four to five million people right now that if you were simply to either invite them to your home and to church, they, you know, let's go have a meal. Would you like to come to church? All four million of them would say yes. I did the math. That works out to within about a 20-minute drive of where I'm standing, there's about 15,000 people who are just waiting to be talked to. You've been given the authority. You've been given the permission by Jesus, the resurrected Savior himself, to go make and become a disciples. We've been given the greatest community, the church. I'm not just talking about Rustin Prez. The church is the greatest community to ever exist, full of broken people, but it's still the greatest community to ever exist. We've been given that. And we've been given Jesus Christ himself who will never leave our side. All this was made possible because of the resurrection. How will you apply the resurrection to you becoming a disciple this morning? Please close with me in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time together. And we ask that you would apply the resurrection to our faith. Lord, help us to not fear being a disciple, but to embrace it. To not fear making disciples, but to see the need for it. And to not fear sharing our faith, but understand the necessity of it. All because the resurrection is true. Jesus, it's in your name we pray. Amen. We are now going to celebrate the Lord's Supper.